Jell's Kitchen Clara, a bright, comfortable, relaxing cafe to enjoy a delicious breakfast, mouth-watering lunch, or grab a fresh handmade sandwich or pastry with the best coffee in town. We cater for all events, big or small, from birthdays, christenings, communions, and so much more, with free parking, covered outdoor seating, and a full takeaway menu. So whatever you're hungry for, Jell's Kitchen Clara have you covered. Broadcasting live from the little town of Clara County Offaly, it's What's the Story with Lloyd Bracken. Get in touch today through all our social channels and have your say. Oh, and thanks for listening. Now it's over to you, Lloyd. What's the story? Now for today, tonight. Father Niall Malloy, two years dead this summer, was evidence deliberately withheld from the coroner's inquest. The coroner said the full facts hadn't emerged. To date tonight carries the story further. Just before dawn on July the 8th, 1985, Sergeant Kevin Ford was awakened by a knock on his door. At the door was the parish priest of Clara, Father James Dyman. He informed Sergeant Ford that a priest was lying dead on the bedroom floor of Richard and Teresa Flynn. Fifteen minutes later, at 3.30, Sergeant Ford arrived at Kilcorsey House. In the living room sat Richard Flynn. He sat on a couch, calm and composed, and drinking a cup of coffee. He apologised for bringing Sergeant Ford out so late. It's a messy old business, he added. Kevin Ford went to the bedroom, where he saw the dead man, Father Niall Malloy, and noted injuries to the face. The priest had been beaten to death. At 3.30 in the morning, Inspector Tom Monaghan arrived from Tullamore Guard the station. Richard Flynn stated to both the guards, I am the culprit. One year after Father Malloy met his violent death, Richard Flynn appeared in the circuit criminal court, charged with manslaughter and assault. He was acquitted. Six weeks later, an inquest was held. More detail emerged, but the coroner informed the jury that the full facts of what happened that night had not emerged. Hi everyone, very welcome back to What's the Story, episode 18, with myself Lloyd Bracken. Glad to say we are now in the top 100 arts podcast on Apple iTunes, so thank you very much for everyone for downloading. A bit of a different podcast this week, we look back at one of the biggest events that happened here in our little town, the death of Father Niall Malloy in Kilcorsey House in 1985. There have been various court cases and trials in relation to his death, meanwhile family are still looking for answers. This podcast is not a retrial or to question anyone's innocence or guilt, I must stress that. A new documentary regarding Father Niall's uh, life and death is currently in production. I now speak to the producer of that documentary, Sharon Lawless. Thanks very much for joining me for the chat today, Sharon. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Lloyd. Sharon, we'll get to the events in Clara in a few minutes. Father Niall Malloy, 52 years old, a Catholic priest from Roscommon, a talented horseman and a very popular figure in his parish, What can you tell us about Father Niall and his life before his untimely death in 1985? Well, he had quite a lot going on in his life. He was originally from uh, Roscommon Town, just outside Roscommon Town, from Carrow Row House, which was one of the the big old houses outside the town. And he was the second youngest of nine children. Um, His father was a Fine Gael senator and a businessman. The family had a number of businesses in Roscommon. And uh, Niall grew up there. He was very into horses. He went to the local primary school, then went to Sligo. And from there, he pretty much went straight to study for the priesthood in Maynooth and Rome. And he was ordained in Rome in, I think it was 1957. He maintained his interest in horses throughout his life and was very highly regarded in horse circles as having a really good eye for a horse. He would have bought and sold horses over the years um, in partnership with Teresa Flynn, was very highly regarded in show jumping circles because they were the the type of horses that they were looking at. He served in the army for a number of years based in costume barracks in Athlone and went out to Cyprus in 1972 for six months with the Irish army, served out there. And by all accounts, he loved being an army chaplain. I think he loved the regime. Uh, He loved the camaraderie, but he was only there, I think, about maybe four years, three or four years when he was appointed to Castlecoot Parish back in Roscommon. And he was there for 10 years before he passed away. But he was a he was a frequent visitor to Clara. He would have been there a few times a week. 
he was very close to the Flynn family. They had known each other for years because I think he, he would have met Teresa Flynn when uh, she was involved in show jumping as a teenager and young woman as well. So he would have been a, a familiar face around Clara for a number of years. And um, yeah, I think he kind of divided his time between Clara and his parish in Castle Coote, spent half his time uh, with his horses and the other half tending to his parishioners. So that was his, I, I suppose, his life in a in a nutshell up until the time of his death. So, I mean, a man in the prime of his life with, with a huge full life up to that 52 years on 7th of July 1985 began as usual with a celebration of Sunday Mass in his parish of 40. Later, however, he made his way to Clara, County Offaly. He went to Kilcorsey uh-huh. House, the home of friends of three decades, Richard and Theresa Flynn, to join in the revelries of a wedding of Maureen Flynn. Although he did not officiate at that wedding. Did you find that strange at all? I did uh, to begin with. But then when I looked into it a little bit more, apparently when you're a, a parish priest, your preference and I suppose your responsibility is to your parish first and foremost. There was another wedding taking place in Castle Coote on the same day as um, Maureen's wedding. So he would have been responsible for officiating at that wedding first and foremost, and then coming back down to Maureen's wedding, which is the way it happened. So I'm not sure that he would have had a choice uh, whether to marry Maureen or not, because his parish had to come first. Recap, if that's at all possible. I know there's a lot of details, 35 years on now, but perhaps there are some people Mm -hmm. listening who are not familiar with what happened in Kilcorsey House in July 1985, or indeed the events leading up to that fateful night in which led to Father Niall Malloy's untimely death. Well, it was um, a wedding weekend. Teresa and Richard Flynn's eldest daughter, Maureen, was getting married to Ralph Parks from Limerick. And they were having the wedding at home in Kilcorsey House. You know, the people would know Kilcorsey House. It's a beautiful old house uh, built by the Good Bodies and bought by the Flynns. I think it was probably about 1981. Uh, there was a lot of land around it and they had a, a marquee to the side of the house where the wedding was going to be. There were about 215 guests. The Parks are a very well-known family in Limerick. And then obviously the Flynns would have had a a lot of friends in the area as well. It seemed to be, um, like obviously with 215 people, it was a big wedding. There would have been politicians there, celebrities, because Teresa's sister, I think, was married to Brendan Boyer. The Parks family were quite involved with Fianna Fáil. Theresa Brennan's background would have been Fianna Fáil as well. So there were politicians, Fianna Fáil politicians at the wedding. And a lot has been made of that. Brian Lenehan and his wife Anne, Brian Lenehan Sr. and his wife Anne were there. Anne and Theresa had gone to UCD together. So there were great pals, great wedding by all accounts. And um, Father Malloy came down, I think probably about seven o'clock on Saturday evening and stayed for a number of hours celebrating the wedding and then went back to Castle Coote because he'd celebrate Mass the next morning, which he did. He travelled back down to Clara on Sunday afternoon because the Flynns were putting on a, a lunch for whoever was still around who had stayed in the area um, after the wedding. Friends, uh, close family friends, um, family members. So there would have been a number of people invited to lunch Started around two o'clock, I suppose, went on for a number of hours. And then when it broke up, maybe about seven o'clock or so, the evidence is that Father Malloy, um, Teresa and Richard travelled to Douglas Goodbody's house, which is um, Cork Hill in Clara, for drinks. And they left there about maybe quarter past nine or thereabouts. Some of the younger people had stayed behind in Kilcorsey to look after an old aunt who was in the house. The rest of them went on to White's Pub in Clara. When Teresa and Richard and Father Niall came back to Kilcorsey, they relieved the rest of the the younger people who were there. There are a few different versions of what happened next. Um, But generally speaking, Auntie May, who was the, the elderly aunt, Uh, Richard, Teresa and Father Niall were having a chat and a drink downstairs. Teresa went up to bed. She took a sleeping tablet and went up to bed. Auntie May was supposed to have gone to bed sometime, maybe between half nine and 12 o'clock. 
Richard and Father Nile were having a chat and Richard suggested that they continue the chat upstairs in the bedroom. And I suppose being friends for so many years and Father Nile having a bedroom in the house, it wasn't that unusual a suggestion. So they um, they were up in the bedroom. Um, Teresa recalls waking up and um, Richard was in the bed beside her, dressed in his pyjamas. Father Nile was sitting at the end of the bed and the two men were having a chat. Teresa suggested to Richard that he would go down and get more drinks because she didn't have a drink. And uh, Richard's evidence was that he said to her that she had enough to drink. Father Nile had a full glass. He didn't need another drink. And Richard would look after himself. And his testimony is that Teresa and Father Nile both jumped up and attacked him physically. And he defended himself. And in doing so, hit Teresa, um, knocking her unconscious. Uh, she fell on the floor and he hit Father Nile. Um, Father Nile got back up again and Richard hit him again and knocked him unconscious. He realised that they were both unconscious, went into the ensuite bathroom, got some water and splashed them, thinking that that might wake them up. Teresa is said to have come to at that point, but Father Nile didn't. Richard then started to look for Father Dignan, who was the local parish priest. He just lived across the road in Drayton Villa, I think it's called. Um, so he rang Father Dignan to come over and give Father Nile the last rites because he realised that Father Nile wasn't getting back up again. He was unconscious and his breathing was quite raspy. So Father Dignan came over, gave Father Nile the last rites and then went downstairs to help Richard call a doctor. Uh, Dr. Dan O'Sullivan, who was based in Kilbegan, was the family GP and a close family friend. Um, and they were trying to contact him and there was no reply from his phone. So Father Dignan and one of the Flynn daughters drove to Kilbegan to wake up Dr. O'Sullivan. At that stage, the younger kind of wedding crowd had come back from the pub. So they were all in the house as well and realised, obviously, that there was something wrong with Father Nile. Dr. O'Sullivan was woken up by Father Dignan and uh, I think it was Zandra Flynn and drove back out to Kilcorsey. Um, at that point, he was able to deduce that Father Malloy had died and Teresa was hysterical. So he gave um, Teresa a sedative and I think Maureen, um, whose wedding it was that weekend, she was a nurse and uh, she tried to calm Teresa down. Then Dr O'Sullivan took Teresa to Tullamore Hospital and Maureen went with them and maybe one of the other girls as well. And at about, I think it was about 3.30, Father Dignan went across to the Garda barracks, woke up Kevin Ford, Sergeant Kevin Ford, who was living there at the time, said to Kevin, a uh, priest has been killed up in Kilcorsey, is there any chance you can keep it quiet? Um, at which point Kevin said no and dressed in his uniform, went across to Kilcorsey, was met by Dr O'Sullivan, who had returned from Tullamore Hospital and went upstairs to the master bedroom and found Father Nile's body. It was almost lying across the bedroom door. You know, you would mm -hmm. the bedroom door wasn't couldn't open fully because Father Nile's body was in the way. And he went in and found Father Nile lying close to the door and a a long streak of, of blood, maybe about eight feet long streak of blood between the bed and Father Malloy's body. Father Malloy was fully nice. dressed. Then he went down and Richard was in his pajamas and dressing gown and he said, I'm the culprit. I did it. From then on, it was just taking statements. Okay. Sharon, just um, go back for a second. Did it strike yeah. anybody as odd that a priest would be rang in a matter of an emergency and not an ambulance? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Nobody dialed 999 all night. And when Father Dignan was questioned about this at the inquest, he claimed that he didn't know what 999 was, that he'd never heard of it, which seemed a bit bizarre. Um, and it did seem odd that whatever about, let's say, the initial panic, you know, and 
maybe trying to wake somebody up in the hope that that they're going to wake up, somewhat understandable. But then as the house filled up with people, you would think that somebody at some point would have rung 999 who might have been, you know, less panicked, maybe a little bit more level headed, you know, who would have realised the situation. So that's that's one of the, the questions that remains is yeah. why did nobody dial 999? It's an obvious thing to do. Yeah, because later medical evidence would suggest that it took Father Malai a number of hours to die. Yeah, and, you know, as part of that as well, it was difficult to pinpoint his time of death. And looking at the original post-mortem, you can see that, you know, and, and subsequent questions in the trial and inquest. There was a big question mark over what time he did actually die at and what time the attack took place at. But subsequent uh, examinations of uh, some of the forensic material indicated that he could have lived for a number of hours. It certainly seems that it was about two o'clock, I think, maybe five past two, when Dr O'Sullivan arrived out. And at that stage, he reckoned that Father Malloy was was dead. I don't think he, he did much of an examination um, because I think he was focusing on Teresa. But if the attack took place at 11 o'clock, you know, he was still, he was alive for three hours. If it took place at 12 o'clock, he was alive for two hours. Whatever way you look at it, he was alive for a number of hours and didn't receive any medical assistance. Sure, this is obviously a fascinating case still to this day, not only for a small midland town like Clara, but for the for the country. A story perhaps mm. some would say an almost movie script scenario with a, with a sad outcome. It remains a huge part of Clara to this day. Will this document, what will the documentary entail and what will we learn from it that we don't know already? Well, I think that for a start, the documentary is two hours long and it'll probably run over two nights on RTE in the springtime. I think the impact of it at the time in 1985 was massive. And what happens, you know, any time after that, I suppose, you know, with the, with the trial and inquest happening a year later, um, and and they got a lot of headlines as well because they were quite unusual too. And then everything that's been done about the story, there's been a huge amount of print media. And on TV, there have been, you know, maybe short documentaries like Sconnell. And then the Today Tonight programme that you ran the clip from is probably, you know, the programme that you could nearly run again now and still ask the same questions. The way I wanted to approach it was to tell the whole story and not just kind of bursts of the story and to do it in such a way that the different legal aspects of it could be explained properly to the audience. And some of the reasons why it was, you know, considered not to be solved or why it's still open could be explained to the audience and and put into context. And it's also a case that there were a lot of rumours around. You know, the obvious rumour that came out at the time because of where Father Malloy's body was found was that there was an affair going on and that Richard had uncovered it and had reacted to that. And that's still what people think when you mention the case to them. I haven't found any evidence of that. But I think what we will, we will achieve is... We will make the people involved into people rather than just characters or names involved in this case. Most people don't know about Father Malloy's background. And I think in a lot of cases like this where there is a violent death and that the victim's name is mentioned, it's always in connection with the manner in which they die. Yeah. And yet everybody deserves a little bit more recognition, a lot more recognition for what they've achieved in their lifetime and not just the manner of their death. And it's very upsetting for the family and friends of Father Nile and for any family and friends of the victim of a violent death, that that's all they're remembered for. So I would hope that it would, that, that we can dispel some of the rumours, maybe go through the, the evidence, go through some of the facts I want to have a very factual approach to it. You know, look, this is this is what we know happened. This is what we know didn't happen. And this is what we don't know happened. Okay. You know? Will it involve a reconstruction? The reconstructions we're doing in the context of the kind of documentaries that you'd see on Netflix or Amazon, you know, documentaries like The Jinx or The Keepers, where there's no dialogue involved because sometimes those kind of reconstructions can be a little bit cheesy and then you're using actors and actresses 
to portray real people. And I think that families in that instance are never really happy with how their, their loved one is portrayed. And I suppose it, it's a creative kind of stylistic thing as well, that the recreations are creative and you kind of see things being done, but you don't see people's faces. You don't see, you know, a lot of that kind of detail. It's very stylized. But what we have done as part of the reconstruction in a, in a kind of real sense is I've built a set of the bedroom and ensuite of the room in Kilcorsey on that night. And that's based on, there was a Garda drawing, you know, kind of a layout of the room yeah. with measurements. So we've done everything to scale. We were able to get descriptions of the room, the furniture, the way it was laid out and everything from uh, people who were there, um, who were there that night. And uh, we've reconstructed it according to that so that where we would have maybe tested some of the evidence, I wanted it to be legitimate. Let's say, you know, if the bed was was five foot by seven foot in reality in Kilcorsey in 1985, our bed needed to be five foot by seven foot on the set so that, you know, if we were saying, OK, well, this is where Father Nala was supposed to have fallen. This is where he was supposed to have hit his head. You know, given his height, given the dimensions of the room, is that possible? Is that likely? So from that point of view, we have that bedroom set, which has been fantastic. We got three experts in to have a look at the um, the testimonies, the statements, the forensic reports, the post-mortem post -mortem report. They kind of put their brains together, and I suppose, in 2020, you know, knowing what we know now about forensics, and everything else, they were able to give a little bit of insight into what might have happened or what's likely to have happened. So that's really interesting. And I don't think that's been done in a documentary here before to actually build a set of the location and have it identical to the way it was on the night. So that's really exciting. And I, and I hope that that comes across well. But it also means that, you know, if we are challenging some of the evidence at least we're comparing like with like. Yeah, it's a huge undertaking with with some amount of details. Why the interest in this documentary, yeah. Sharon? Is there a personal interest for you of any kind? No, not at all. I mean, coincidentally, my my mom is from Ballinagore, and I've a whole load of cousins uh, living around Kilbegan. So you know, I do have a link to the general area, but not to Clara. I don't know any of the people involved. I did my leaving the year that it happened, so I remember it from then, and I remember the shock of the case. I also remember what society was like at the time, and it's very different to the way it is now. There was this huge respect for the guards, for the government, for politicians and for the church. And obviously an awful lot has happened in the meantime to undermine all of that. But I think it was just the idea that this had happened. It didn't seem to have been solved his family were still campaigning. And I and I do feel very strongly that the full story of a case like this or any violent death or, or murder is never fully brought to light. And I don't mean that there's anything hidden. I mean, you know, different people have spoken to me about relatives of theirs who suffered a violent death and they are, you know, so upset that their loved one's life is raked over as if they deserved it almost. And, you know, they've spoken about the amount of facts that don't make it to court or that don't make it from court into the media and all the things that go on in the background and the effect that it has on them decades later and how they feel when, you know, suddenly somebody mentions that that murder case and their loved one and they're straight back there again, you know. And I think it's something that we haven't really looked at before. And I think with the amount of violent deaths that have taken place here and the amount of families who have been affected and the amount of cases that haven't been fully resolved, that it's something that we do need to talk about. And I think that this particular case had so many aspects to it and there was so much about it that even though I had followed it over the years, I didn't actually know an awful lot about it till I really got stuck in and started doing research and started talking to the family of Father Malloy. So I just thought, look, this is a story that has to be told. It's absolutely fascinating. I think because it's been fragmented over the years, not everybody would get the whole 
story. And it just struck me, you know, like I would come across one aspect and think, oh, my God, that's that's bizarre. Or come across something else and go, oh, my God, I don't believe that. And then next thing I read, the general stole the file, yeah. you know, so you got everything. And then the general, you know, who, who was such a big character in the early 90s. Um, so it really had everything. And I really did want to tell the full story and do justice to the people involved, not just to, to Father Nile as the victim, but to the Flynn family as well, you know, because this is something they've lived with mm -hmm. as well for a very long time. Yeah, and of course, Clara Town as well. Completely, completely. And certainly I would have spoken to a number of people who, you know, wouldn't be that happy that, you know, you mentioned Clara and straight away, you know, this death is mentioned, you know, that Clara has an awful lot more going for it than a notorious case, you know. And I think it needs to be fair to Clara and the reputation of Clara that, you know, this is brought out. And in recent weeks, we have spoken to a number of locals, just just people on the street that we bumped into. And I we were down there about a month ago as well, doing some filming at night time. I have to say the the support and good wishes from the locals was was incredible and really heartening because I am very conscious of the effect that this has on the community and the story being told properly and compassionately. But certainly there seems to be a feeling that it needs to be told fully. You know, it needs to be it, it needs an ending. It needs closure. Yeah, I was going to ask um, you, had, had you gauged the mood from the Clara people and they're happy to see this documentary come to fruition? Yeah, for the most part. Um, I'm sure there'll be plenty of people who don't want it raised again. You know, when I when I started off and I did talk to a couple of different people, I, you know, was told, look, that's old news. You know, most people in Clara of a certain age don't even know what happened. We don't need it raised again. But then more recently, um, it has been much more positive. And I think it's because of the approach that we're not saying, you know, oh, here's this big sensationalist case and here's all the scandal that we are actually doing it in a humane way and in a detailed way and with respect. And I think maybe that that, that has come across in what we're doing. So certainly a lot of people have been really helpful and gone out of their way to to help us. And that, that really is appreciated because it does make a difference. You don't want to be going into um, a community where you think people might see you as a, a threat or where you're unwelcome or where you don't even get the opportunity to explain what you're doing. So it's important that there is that support there in Clara for what we're doing. Is there a support there from Father Niles' family cooperating? Yes, in a big way. His nephew, Bill Maher, would be the person who you would see anytime there's any press coverage or anything on TV or radio. He is kind of heading up the campaign for justice on behalf of the family. So he had set up a Facebook page and um, that's you know where I found him and went to meet him. So again, with that family, I have to be very careful and very conscious of their memories of Father Nile, who they adored, and that he would be represented properly, but also objectively. I mean, I do have a responsibility to be objective. Uh, you know, it can't be a one-sided documentary about Father Nile. It has to be about everybody, and it has to be objective, and it has to be balanced. So they are hugely supportive. And you know, it was a little bit difficult in the beginning because they're still very emotional about it. They, Some of them are, are getting older and wouldn't be in great health and are worried that they won't see closure on this, that they won't receive justice as they see it and get Niall's name cleared um, on time for them. Um, so that's a big issue for them. But they've been really supportive and very open and very honest and it's very raw for them still, even 35 years on. I can imagine, yeah. Sharon, just yeah. going to get a little perspective of what Clara was like 
back in 1985. Uh, we have a little piece here from Barry Flynn, who remembers that time well. Clara was an industrial town, primarily because of a family called the Good Buddies, who set up the famous Good Buddies factory. The Good Buddy family built a number of big houses around the town, such as Kilcorsey House, but also others like Inchmore, which became St Anthony's of eventually, also Upton House, Ashmount, which is now Ravensburgs. Over time, these houses eventually went up for sale and the Flynn family bought one of them, Kilcorsey House. However, the people of Clara didn't know a lot about the Flynn family because unlike the Good Buddies, the Flynn family had nothing to do with the factories in Clara. Most people didn't uh, particularly know uh, Richard and Theresa Flynn, although those who did know them he said they were decent people. Likewise, Father Niall Malloy was a reasonably regular visitor to the town and would often be seen riding his horse around Clara. Again, most people didn't know who he was until his photograph appeared in the paper, but those who had met him said he seemed to be a very friendly person and would greet them with a smile. In 85, Clara was a very different place as the world was. There had been a recession in Ireland. It had decimated many, many towns, but thankfully not Clara. Good Buddy's factory remained open and provided great employment. Bopa was going very, very well at the time, the meat factory. So, as I said, other towns were decimated. Clara wasn't. The town was doing very, very well. If we look at the way the world was at the time, and particularly Ireland, there was no internet, there was no Facebook, there was no local radio stations. So your only media outlets were the two television stations, RTE 1 and 2, and Radio 1 and 2. Kilcorsey was a much quieter and less populated area than it is now. A lot of the housing estates, Beachmount might have been there, Heather Grove, Abbey Court weren't there. Not sure about Silverdale, I doubt if Oakview was there at the time. So a lot of people would not have been up around that area, the Kilcorsey area, a lot. There wouldn't have been as much traffic or even pedestrian traffic as there is now. When it came to the events uh, of the wedding, most people didn't know what was going on. I think the first thing that anyone knew about really was a marquee or a large tent, which was very unusual at the time, was set up and you could see the roof of this tent in behind the wall of Kilcorsey House. It raised a couple of questions as to what's going on there. And eventually, of course, word got out that there was a wedding. The events at the wedding and the death of Father Malloy are well documented at this stage, but by today's standards, it took a long time for the people of the town to find out. In my own case, I went to Tullamore on the morning after. I managed to go all the way through Clara, went into a couple of shops, and it was actually when I was in Tullamore that I found out the news at about lunchtime uh, on the day after those mysterious events. So Sharon, that was Barry Flynn, just to give a little perspective of what Clara was like back then. A different place, of course. Yeah, and I mean, everything he says is what I heard when I started talking to people in Clara in terms of the the Flynn family and the wedding and the marquee. They did seem to, like, I, I think people knew who they were around the town, but they didn't seem to be hugely involved and I, I think when Father Nile would have gone down there, he would have been in civvies. He wasn't dressed as a priest. So, you know, again, people would have seen him around the place, but not necessarily known he was a priest. But yes, everything that Barry has, has said resonates, you know, and you can see when he's talking about the area around Kilcorsey, you can see the estates he's talking about and the houses he's talking about were were built since then for the most part, you know, that it would have been much quieter and on a road you know, leading out, which wasn't, you know, a hugely developed road to Kilbegan. So, yeah, everything that he says there is very evocative of the time. How does your documentary, Sharon, deal with years of rumours and and hearsay? Uh, And will you debunk any of these alleged stories? Well, that's something I'm very conscious of as well, because there's, you know, there was the testimony and, you know, what was said, what was claimed to have happened, There are rumours and other theories about what happened. And then there's what happened. And that's the most difficult thing to find out because not all the evidence that's needed and not all the statements and witness testimony is available 
uh, to anybody. So I think what we need to do is to raise those rumors and raise those theories and not so much debunk them, but just try and find out the facts. I mean, for instance, you know, with that big kind of conclusion that people jumped to at the time that because of the bedroom, because of the situation between the three of them, this must have been an affair. They must have been caught. And that's what happened. And of course, Richard Flynn's evidence debunked that straight away. But that was the perception. And we do need to look at that. And we look at that in terms of, okay, well, what was the relationship? Would that have been going on for so long? And this is where somebody like our forensic psychologist, um, who's one of our experts on the set, would talk about relationship dynamics and the relationship between the, the three adults in that situation. And the fact that Father Niall and Teresa did know each other, and Richard, they all knew each other for decades. So, yeah, I think we have to raise them. We have to challenge them. Mm -hmm. We have to see what is likely. And what I'm, you know, saying to people who I would like to take part in it, you know, for instance, bodies of people like the guards or the church is to say, look, there are question marks over what was and wasn't done, you know, over involved over the involvement of certain people, over the fact that there seems to have been a cover up. And if you don't come and tell us about that and tell us about what actually happened, then there's always going to be a question mark over it. And that's really where it lies. And in every re-examination of the case, that has been the conclusion that if nobody comes forward to tell the truth or, you know, any of the witnesses who are still alive, and of course, many of them have passed away, with the absence of all the forensic material, that all disappeared. It's like it's one step forward and two steps back. You know, if you if you don't have people coming forward to say their bit, if you don't have forensic evidence, there isn't an awful lot more you can do. Yeah. You know, it's just to kind of put it out there and, and maybe just see how likely the different things are. But certainly, you know, when it comes to the rumour of the affair, I, again, unless somebody comes along and, and corrects me, and we also have to say that nobody knows what goes on between two people ever. I certainly haven't seen any evidence of that. OK, so many uh, other elements in this case. In June 1986, Richard Flynn went to court, charged with manslaughter and assault of Father Niall Malloy. But the outcome of that court case came to a very speedy conclusion. In fact, less than four hours after proceedings began, Judge Frank Rowe directed the jury to deliver a not guilty verdict to that of Richard Flynn. Can you explain how such a huge case of its time with public interest lasted four hours? Yeah, and this is something that we were looking at the other day. We were discussing it with one of the the legal people who was involved in the inquest, but had had looked extensively at the, the trial. And it's something that we are going to spend a good bit of time on um, in the documentary, because at the end of the day, the fact that Richard was acquitted meant that it didn't matter what else came out, you know, what happened at the inquest or anything else. He was he was acquitted, so he couldn't be recharged. And I think what happened was there were there were some people who were called to give evidence the morning of the trial. And the trial would have been booked in to run for quite a while. One of those people was Dr. John Harbison, who was the state pathologist at the time. And he had done the postmortem the day after Father Malloy's death. Very, very detailed. And in the book of evidence, the cause of death was put down as whatever the term is for head injuries. And the team that there was, it was actually the state who were against Richard Flynn. They were bringing the charge against Richard Flynn rather than the Malloy family. So the state had, you know, a good, strong team. There was Raymond Grork, who was the barrister uh, for the state. Patrick McEntee, who is legendary as uh, an operator in the court, that he was supposed to have been this great showman, fantastic power of language, and just had a great way of, I suppose, presenting a case in the favour of whoever it was he was there to act for. To simplify it a little bit, they were going through the post-mortem report with Dr. Harbison. It was put to him that Father Malloy had a pre-existing heart condition and could that have contributed to his death? Of course, it was possible. Um, so John Harbison had to reply, well, yes, it's possible. 
that point, it was, you know, put to him that Father Malloy's heart condition was responsible for his death and not any of the head injuries that were reported, that were found afterwards. Raymond Grork actually gave a fantastic rebuttal argument to that and gave all the reasons why that couldn't be the case and referred back to the post-mortem. Then Judge Rowe had dismissed the jury at that point. It was concluded that Father Malloy, in the excitement and the adrenaline of having an argument with a friend, that everything was raised. He had a heart attack. Richard had admitted to hitting him twice or three times. So that was why there were two or three injuries to his head and that the severe head injuries were caused by him falling after having a heart attack and hitting his head on the bedpost or the television on the way down. He brought the jury back in and directed them to acquit Richard Flynn. That was bizarre enough in that it only the, the whole case only took four hours. The fact that this was a jury trial, that it was the jury who were supposed to hear all the evidence and make their judgment, that it wasn't up to Judge Rowe to step in uh, without all the evidence being heard and to direct the jury that, you know, there are cases where the judge makes the decision, but this was not one of them. It was done so quickly with such a devastating and a, a, a result that could not be overturned that I think he was under the impression that he had done, you know, a favour, that it was, look, this was an argument between good friends so much drink was taken, a row broke out and a man has died. He can't be brought back. And why ruin another man's life? You know, it was totally bizarre. What was that uh, court case like in today's standards? Oh, it would never happen now. I mean, the forensic evidence alone should have taken hours, if not like a, a couple of days, as we see now with court cases. I mean, there was a lot of forensic evidence taken. They wouldn't have had the technology that we have now with with DNA, it would have been presented as, you know, blood samples, fingerprints, clothing, all of that. And it was, you know, that was dealt with very meticulously. However, there was a huge issue in that samples that were taken, you know, fingerprints that were taken weren't matched. Blood samples that were taken were only matched against the three people who were said to be in the room at the time. So when the case was looked at again and all these anomalies started to come out or be discussed, the forensic evidence had disappeared. So it couldn't be tested again, you know, to say, OK, well, look, there were blood samples taken. But what about other evidence of blood? You know, let's let's recheck the clothes that had blood stains on them. You know, there was none of that that was done. So I think by today's standards, a case like that would certainly go on an awful lot longer. There would be a lot more challenges to the evidence than there was at the time. I mean, there's no way that the, the challenges that should have been made and the witnesses that should have given testimony could have been done in the space of four hours. I don't know how long it was supposed to run for, but certainly it wasn't one day. Six weeks after that court case, then there was an inquest and to me would appear that there was a lot more information available and people put in the witness box at that inquest. It seemed a lot more detailed than the actual trial. Why was that? Um, the inquest, I think, served, served a lot more than the trial did. The inquest is totally objective. It is a sworn inquest. I still find it fascinating that Irish law in a criminal case, that the inquest is held after the criminal trial because... And I'm sure there's a legal reason for it. But as a, as a Joe Soap, I would think, but if the cause of death is found, surely that impacts on the, the charge in the trial of whoever's on trial. But anyway, the, the law states that the inquest is held afterwards. It was a sworn inquest. And I think it was the state's opportunity and probably their duty after the the bizarre trial that had happened, that they needed to ensure that the inquest didn't meet with the same fate. And Alan Dukes was the Minister for Justice at the time. I think he wanted to ensure that the same mistakes weren't made, that the proper evidence could be heard and that justice would be done. And the limitations of an inquest are 
you know, I mean, I suppose the reason for an inquest is to find out who has died and how they have died and where they have died. And it's it's remit isn't to find anything else. It's not to decide who has caused the death. It's just to find out the cause of death. So I think that the, the state were very keen that everything would be done above board. And the Malloy family as well at that point were just so devastated with the outcome of the trial that they also wanted to ensure that all the facts were heard. And yes, there were people called to the stand in the inquest that hadn't been called in the trial. So the inquest actually went on for two full days. And then it was a Thursday and Friday. And then the state solicitor asked the the family, you know, did they want to continue on into the following day, which was a Saturday, rather than drive up and down to and from Dublin and everywhere else for it. So he really did his summing up on Saturday. Uh, The jury went away uh, with different options for what they would find. And they came back in a very, very short space of time. I think it was minutes rather than hours with the verdict that he had died from head injuries and not a heart attack or, or anything to do with his heart. So it found the opposite of the trial, but nothing could be done at that point. It was bittersweet, I suppose, for the family, the Malloy family, in that the the proper cause of death had been established, that he had been beaten to death, but nothing could be done about it. In 1994, Sharon, there were claims that, in fact, Judge Rowe was known to the Flins. This is something that is a little bit difficult because it is one of those rumours that seem to be very feasible. The horsey community would know each other, but it's a very big community. You have the show jumping community who are a bit like a family. And certainly at that time, it was much smaller than it is now. And it was, you know, the money involved wasn't as much as it is now. It's changed considerably. So all the show jumping people would have known each other. Judge Rowe was was more involved in horse racing. So it's a different discipline. So while he was involved in horsey circles, it may not have been the same horsey circles. Somebody who is involved in that did say the other day to us, look, you know, it it is a big industry. I might know a whole load of people to see and to say hello to, and I know who they are, but I don't know anything else about them. That doesn't mean that I know them enough to make a life-changing decision on their behalf. But certainly Judge Rowe was very well known for circulating in those circles and for being passionate about horse racing. As a judge, I think he was considered to be very reasonable, lived in the real world. And, you know, maybe he did think that this was the the best way of doing it, that this was a terrible accident and that he was doing everybody a favour. Certainly he was involved in the horse industry. How well he knew any of the, the people involved, the Flynn's or Father Malloy, is debatable. But there is a link, you know, it, I just don't know how strong that link was. Another factor from that inquest that Father Malloy's wristwatch was allegedly returned to his family broken. What do we know about that? That's kind of contentious as well. His watch was um, handed back to them broken and with the watch stopped at, I think it was 10.40. You know, like all good dramas that we see on TV and in some cases as well where there is an accident and there is damage to a watch. You know, it does indicate the time that an attack or a death took place. But then there was controversy because, number one, it was handed back to the family a couple of days after his death. And then they were questioning why it was stopped at 2211, that that would indicate that he was attacked at that point. So it became, you know, a big question. And it was something that came up before the inquest. There were guards who had said at the time, yes, I saw the watch, it, I noticed that it was broken and I noticed that it was stopped. And then there were other guards who said, well, no, we were at the post-mortem and uh, Dr. Harbison was talking about another case that he had worked on, the Air India disaster, some of the, the victims of that. Their watches were broken at the time that the crash took place. And then there were other watches that kept going, you know, so it was all this conversation. So you had some guards saying it was definitely broken and it was definitely stopped. And then there were other guards who gave evidence at the inquest who were brought in to to give evidence saying, no, 
we saw it, it was still going, it wasn't broken. You know, the importance of the watch, there was a lot of importance given to it at the time, but it is one of those situations where it's kind of not beyond reasonable doubt, you know, what happened to it. If some people said they saw it and it was working and then other people say the opposite, where do you go with that? Yeah. You know, the watch is still around, but it's been repaired in the meantime. The guards had seen that there wasn't blood on the watch, so they didn't rate it as being valuable in terms of forensics, whereas they possibly should have held on to it and examined it a little bit more before giving it back to the family. OK, over the years also, there were several anonymous letters written to Niall Malloy's family, and they have been published, including one from a waiter who claimed to be working at the wedding of Maureen Flynn. Were these letters ever investigated in any way? Yes, I think they were. That letter was sent from Limerick. And, you know, when you read it, you go, OK, well, that could make sense. But I don't think that the person who wrote it could ever be traced. They claimed to have been a waiter on the day of the, the lunch, which was the day after the wedding. But having spoken to the caterer of the second day, they said that they didn't actually cater the second day that they delivered the food that was left over from the wedding the following day. They delivered it. A waiter and waitress stayed for about an hour and then they were called back to the bridge house in Tullamore. So what that letter writer claimed was that they had seen what had happened, but there was no waiter or waitress there at that time of night. They had gone back to the bridge house by two, three o'clock that day. So the, I suppose the information that was contained in that letter was looked at. I think it was investigated, but it came back to the idea that if it was a waiter, as they claimed, there was no waiter there at that time. Um, so I think it was it was kind of written off. But there have been loads of different anonymous tips to the family over the years. And there have been loads of, you know, bizarre rumours. You know, even in doing this documentary, people have said to me, oh, yeah, no, I, I saw this and I saw that. And and they're describing something that was much more grotesque, you know, much more bizarre. And I'm going, OK, I know that didn't happen because I have, <laughs> you know, I have access to to the statements, you know. So I think that some things can can grow arms and legs and become fact. And actually, they're just myths. There are some key figures in this case and no longer with us. Is it worrying as the years go on that there will be no infinite closure for the Malloy family? Yeah, that's their huge worry is that um, there are only a handful of people still alive who were said to have been in the house at the time. This was also a, an issue for the serious crime review team uh, when they reinvested the case, that most of the people who were said to have been there on the night are no longer with us. A lot of the people we've interviewed are of a, a certain age. And, um, you know, the people who, who maybe can come forward and uh, can expand on the facts of what happened that night are not likely to come forward. So, yes, it, it is really difficult. And I think that is a big worry for the Malloy family that they may never get closure on this. And I think it's a frustration as well, knowing that there are people out there who were there on the night and who uh, refused to speak to the Gardaí and have never approached the Malloys. And that, you know, if the Malloys knew what had happened, at least they would have some closure. It's not going to be pretty, you know, because he did die, but at least they would have some kind of closure. At least they would know where to place their grief and their frustration. At the moment, it's knowing that people know what happened to Father Niall and that they just don't feel that's fair, that they want to be able to clear his name, I think is very important to them. Just want to mention briefly, in 2014, the McGinn report had highlighted numerous questions. It was a 109-page report. Uh, just some of these, we don't have to go into them all. But why did Gardaí not interview guests who attended the wedding on July 6th? Why no door-to-door -door inquiries carried out? As I read in our local paper, Tullamore Tribune stated that local Garda had little or no input in the case. Also, the McGinn report had stated, why was the parish priest, Father James Dygan, not questioned more? Are these missing pieces key to gaining further evidence of what happened? 
Yeah, they absolutely are. Uh, I mean, talking to Detective Inspector or Superintendent Christy Mangan, who was the head of the SCRT at the time, and he headed up that reinvestigation. And he was saying that he still to this day cannot get a guest list from the Flynn family, that the, the things that he would need to progress the investigation so many years later have not been provided to him and were not provided to him. And I think, you know, understandably in a way, when you have somebody who puts their hand up and says, I'm the culprit, you can understand that the feeling would be, OK, well, we have our man. Yeah. And a lot of people would, would say, OK, he admitted it, he was charged, he was acquitted, and that's the outcome. And justice was served, you know. But there are a huge amount of issues with the original Garda investigation. And, you know, this was uncovered by the Gardaí themselves when they did that reinvestigation and highlighted in the McGinn report. So I think the the key takeaways from the McGinn report were the fact that the original investigation wasn't as thorough as it might have been. There certainly were an awful lot more questions that maybe should have been asked at the time and that whole question of why did nobody ring 999 you know why was Teresa Flynn not kept in the house until the guards were called why would you take somebody away from the scene of a a death like that you know there were a lot of unanswered questions about what was done on the night and you know what should have been done on the night who was there And I expect that they thought a lot of this would be challenged in the trial. And then everybody was shocked that it ended so quickly. But certainly the McGinn report was very critical of the original Garda investigation. And then the more recent reinvestigation found that a big thing for me is that you can't be forced to speak to a guard. Uh, I mean, as as an ordinary person in the street, if a guard stood in front of me and said, listen, we need to talk to you about X, Y, Z, I would tell them A, B, C, D, X, Y, Z. Mm. Um, but apparently you don't have to. So a lot of the people who had given their statement at the time in 1985, when they were reapproached for the reinvestigation, they said, look, we gave our, our statements at the time. We are not changing them. We're not expanding on them. And nor do we have to. So even though there was there was great will to find out more and to investigate what hadn't been investigated at the time, it, it couldn't be done because people had either passed away or they can't be forced to speak or the forensic evidence was gone and couldn't be re-examined. So there were a lot of reasons why the reinvestigation kind of threw out a whole load of new theories and a whole load of people who hadn't been questioned before, but very little could be done about it. OK, we must say, obviously, the McGinn report ruled out after these findings that a further inquiry was not warranted. That must have been very disheartening for the Malloy family. Yeah, and it still is. I mean, in, in the years since then, they have been asking different ministers for justice to open a commission of investigation because that is the only way that people can be forced to speak who refuse to speak to Gardaí and they have to speak under oath and they are compelled to speak. But I think they, you know, weighing everything up, the decision has been, look, you know, the evidence isn't there. There isn't enough there that we can do this. And the family went to GSOC about the fact that the McGinn report had highlighted that the original Garda investigation was so flawed. GSOC came back and said it's not uh, in our remit to discuss anything with retired Gardaí. So then you'd wonder what they what GSOC is for, because if they're if they're not able to talk to Gardaí who have retired and, and Gardaí can retire at the age of 55, what is their function? Because all of uh, most of the, the guards who worked on the original investigation have retired. So, you know, if they can't be spoken to, well, then where do you go from there? Yeah. And that has been the focus for the Malloy family has been to make GSOC, make uh, retired Gardaí or Gardaí who were operational at the time responsible for what they did and responsible because with all the forensic evidence that would have gone to the science lab in Dublin and normally because of 
any possibility of things going missing. One person is given responsibility for that. And yet it came back out of the McGinn report and I think the Garda Ombudsman that they recognised that documents and files and forensic evidence had gone missing, but they had no record of when they went missing or who was responsible. There seems to be a huge lack of detailed explanation for Father Malloy's family and the events surrounding his death and a lot of unanswered questions. Will you be able to provide answers or perhaps some closure? That remains to be seen. I mean, we still have a good amount of filming to do. Uh, We've been delayed considerably by the lockdown. We still have an awful lot of work to do. We have uncovered some additional material. We have discovered other aspects to the case that haven't been uncovered before. I think the only way that this will be resolved will be if somebody realises that 35 years later, there are still a lot of questions to be answered. It needs to be somebody who was there on the night, who witnessed what happened. And they need to feel within themselves that the right thing to do is to come forward and explain what they saw. But if they haven't done that so far, they obviously have a very strong reason not to do that. And if they can't be forced to do that, they're not going to do it by choice. And and I think unless somebody does that, the questions are still going to be there. If we had the forensic evidence, we could have examined that and we could have found an awful lot more detail. But it's gone, you know, and it's it's not going to be found. And that alone means that a lot of questions can't be answered. So you are relying on people feeling that, you know, enough time has passed and that the right thing to do is to give the, the Malloy family closure. Where is the case right now, Sharon? Right now, it is not uh, closed officially. And there's a question mark over that as well, because still being technically open means that it's not subject to the 30 year rule. So, you know, there are uh, a lot of details about the case that haven't been released to the National Archive. I think that the Gardaí are not actively pursuing the case, but they are open to any new evidence that might come to light. Interestingly, one of the things I wanted to do was to, you know, to give everybody a voice in this documentary. And because of the McGinn report being so damning of the original Garda investigation, I wanted the Gardaí to, you know, have a voice in this, even if it was just to explain the limitations of investigations at the time. I mean, apparently Richard Flynn wasn't arrested and held because the Gardaí didn't have powers of detention in 1985. So things that we assume now weren't actually in action at the time. The guards haven't engaged at all with this. Locally, the Gardaí have been incredibly helpful in Clara and Tullamore. They, they couldn't be more helpful to us in terms of facilitating us when we're in the area. But the, the Gardaí as a body haven't chosen to explain the situation or to put it in context unless they decide to between now and the time of broadcast. But again, it's that thing of if they don't come forward and explain why the investigation wasn't done that well in the beginning, then they're always going to be damned for not doing a particularly good investigation in the beginning. You know, I wanted them to explain what happened and explain, was it a case of they had their man? And what are the guard to procedures? You know, is it normal that as soon as the the so-called murder squad come down from Dublin, that the local Gardaí are off the case? Or are they normally a little bit more involved than they were? Mm. Certainly, Kevin Ford, who's been fantastic with us on this, you know, within a matter of hours, he, he was off the case. He was the first man in there. He was the first guard. He was the one who noted everything. I mean, his his evidence of what he saw as the first Garda there is so important and so significant. And yet his his responsibility on the case was gone after a day, all further on. If people would like to help in any way or contribute with information, who can they contact? They can contact me directly. The production company is Flawless Films. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. My email address is Sharon at flawlessfilms.ie. 
yes, I, I'd be happy to hear from anybody who wants to talk and not necessarily, I mean, I don't expect people, you know, to say, oh, well, this is exactly what happened, but just people's thoughts on the matter, you know, and something that they that they might want considered within the documentary. And I think it goes back to what you were saying about the community in Clara, that, you know, we have to be mindful that if this is being broadcast again and being highlighted again, it's, you know, it is going to affect people in Clara. It's going to bring a lot of memories back for people, you know. So certainly we're very conscious of that. But if there's anything else that people feel should be said um, or should be highlighted, I'm delighted for them to tell me because we do want this to be factual. We do want it to be compassionate and thoughtful and at worst tell a a really fascinating story about a a case that has so many mysteries attached to it. And at best, we might get closure for the family as a result. Okay, Sharon, to finish, I must say it's very important to remember Father Niall for more than the circumstances of his death. He was a man in his prime a much-loved family man, parish priest, a sports fan, talented horseman, passionate about the Irish language and a love of current affairs. So we should remember him for who he was and not just how he passed. Completely. And from talking to his family in the beginning, they had nothing but praise for him. And I had to be conscious of maybe discovering another side to him or people having different opinions of him or having different experiences of him because we're all human. We all have different sides. I have heard nothing but praise for him. The word that people have used, every single person has used in connection with him is gentle, that he was a gentle man and a gentleman. So, you know, I really expected to find a flaw, you know, and there's been nothing but praise and respect for him from everybody and that I think was what contributed to the shock of his death. As far as his family are concerned the case is far from over I admire their their strength and their search for closure. When can we expect this fascinating documentary to be aired? We are hoping that we'll get it done and broadcast at the end of February. The difficulty is with with COVID, we have a three month edit minimum to do on this because there there is so much to tell, so many aspects of it that we, while two hours is a long time, it's also a short time to explain every aspect of the case that needs to be considered. So I imagine it'll be the end of February realistically. If we are going to have any significant delays Due to this lockdown, it might even be further out. We need to get it on air soon. RTE need content because, you know, all the stations are just repeating programmes ad nauseum. They do want fresh content. It is an ongoing situation. I mean, it's very much still alive in terms of what the family are doing and making the current Minister for Justice aware of the case and to see if GSOC can, can change their remit in their responsibility for different aspects of Gardaí. So there is a lot that's still happening in real time. You know, I will be keeping people updated. You know, when we finish filming, then I know it's going to be three months from then. Sharon Lawless, thank you very much for joining me on the podcast. It's a fascinating insight into a, a fascinating story, I suppose. Thank you, Lloyd. I really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed it. And it makes such a difference to know that it's the Clara community listening to this because I do want to to hear Clara's voice. Once again, Sharon, thank you very much. Gerald's Kitchen Clara, a bright, comfortable, relaxing cafe to enjoy a delicious breakfast, mouth-watering lunch or grab a fresh handmade sandwich or pastry with the best coffee in town. We cater for all events, big or small, from birthdays, christenings, communions, and so much more, with free parking, covered outdoor seating, and a full takeaway menu. So whatever you're hungry for, Gel's Kitchen Clara have you covered. You just listened to What's the Story with Lloyd Bracken. Check out all our social channels for info on new episodes. Oh, and thanks for listening. On the town.